We're live. We're live. Well, hey, everybody. Uh, welcome to the Gray Zones live stream. We're doing this every single Friday. I'm Mary Matte here with Max Blumenthal, editor in chief of the Gray Zone. Max, how you doing? I'm doing well, Aaron. Uh, I understand there are actually some new developments in the Duma case we've been waiting for for some time. So why don't you brief us and brief me because I actually am not up to date on this at all. Yes, and I'm still getting up to speed on this too, but the OPCW has just put out a report that for the first time blames the Syrian government uh, for an alleged chemical attack in the town of Duma in April 2018. Now, previously, as we've covered, the OPCW has suggested that the Syrian government was guilty of a chemical attack in Duma, but it didn't assign responsibility. It only suggested it, and its findings were used to accuse Syria of committing a chemical attack. Well, now for the first time, it's actually officially named Syria as the perpetrator of a chemical attack in Duma, and it did this through a mechanism in the OPCW called the IIT, uh, the Investigation and Identification Team, and this mechanism was established to officially accuse alleged perpetrators of chemical attacks inside Syria. And this mechanism was largely the product of pressure on the OPCW from the U.S., which has tried very hard to accuse Syria of chemical weapons attacks because, as we know, the allegation that Syria committed a chemical attack was the pretext for the U.S. bombing Syria in both 2018 and 2017. And the incident in 2018, Duma, uh, the one under discussion, is one that we've covered extensively at the Gray Zone. Because that's the case where there's been a trove of leaks showing a massive cover-up that the original OPCW team that went to Duma got on the ground, came back and wrote a report. They found no evidence of a chemical attack. They found evidence pointing to staging by the sectarian death squads on the ground, which they said called for further investigation. But we know now from leaks that we've got at the gray zone that have come out via WikiLeaks and other places that their investigation was compromised. There was a massive cover-up. So the first thing to remember in evaluating any claim made by the OPCW about Syria is that there are allegations of a major cover-up documented by a trove of leaks and that this cover-up has never been addressed. So for many years now, the OPCW has refused to address the documented cases of fraud inside the Duma probe, has refused to meet with the dissenting inspectors, actually has refused to meet with any member of the original team, not just the two whistleblowers that we know about. So any statement that the OPCW puts out now about Duma can't be taken seriously unless they address the documented fraud that occurred in the Duma probe. And since they haven't addressed that fraud and they don't want to because there was a cover-up, uh, now they're putting out a new report to try to basically double down on the fraud. And that's what this report is. And I've only skimmed over it quickly. I haven't read it in detail. I will be doing a lot more on this very soon at the Gray Zone, both on pushback and I'll have a written report as well. So let me just give my... Uh, my initial impressions of this report. There are so many issues in the original Duma probe that point to fraud, and this report addresses none of them. So one issue that we've covered a lot at the gray zone is the issue of toxicologists. So when the initial Duma team was investigating this, they went to a group of expert toxicologists from a NATO member state, and we know now what that state is. It's, they're in Germany. And they presented to those expert toxicologists uh, videos and photos of the civilians in Duma who were in the videos with foam from their mouth and piled in bodies um, across the building where a gas cylinder was found. And these are the videos put out for the world to see to drum up, to, drum up, to drum up support for the claim that Syria was guilty and that the U.S. needed to bomb Syria. And these toxicologists evaluated that video and they said that the symptoms of the victims in that video were completely inconsistent with chlorine gas. And one of the main reasons they concluded that is because the victims had profuse fo uh, foaming from the mouth. And the foaming, they said, these toxicologists said, that was consistent with nerve agents like sarin. Uh, but given the fact there was no trace of sarin or any other nerve agent at all found at the scene, it couldn't have been sarin. But when it comes to chlorine gas, they said that that profuse foaming was completely inconsistent. So they also said this cannot be chlorine gas either. And the original team uh, had that finding, uh, mentioned it in their initial report, 
But what happened to it? It was censored. The OPCW uh, leadership took that out and has never allowed that finding to be released. And we only know about it because of leaks that have been published, including at the Gray Zone. So this new report from the IIT, what does it do with that? Well, it doesn't address the original toxicologists that were consulted. It also doesn't address the other toxicologists who were consulted after that, who also said that they could not link uh, any chemical to the foaming. It consults a new toxicologist who they basically say uh, confirms the view that this could be chlorine gas. Uh, we don't know, of course, who this toxicologist is or how they came to that method, but they found someone to basically validate a uh, claim that they needed to make the case that this was a chlorine that this was a chlorine gas attack that previous toxicologists could not make. But we don't know how. Uh, there's also the issue of ballistics. Uh, this is, you know, how the cylinders hit the roof and caused the damage and penetrated the roofs and and released chlorine gas. They don't address the key issue of th how the damage on the cylinder is completely inconsistent with what was observed at the scene. So at the location two, where the victims were filmed, you had a cylinder on a roof uh, that and uh, and you had the concrete uh, roof with the rebar completely torn open and the damage to the roof and the cylinder were completely inconsistent. And this report doesn't address that. Instead, they uh, go through with the, they say they have a new gas dispersion model that they say makes the case for how the gas could have gone from this hole in the roof all the way down, including into the basement. Uh, but they don't show us what that model is. So that's the issue with ballistics. When it comes to witnesses, they completely ignore the fact that there were a lot of witnesses uh, who stayed inside Syrian territory, who didn't go over to Turkey, over to Idlib, where uh, the, where the rebels went who say that the, basically the incident was staged, that the White Helmets were involved in staging an attack. And the, okay. report, the report doesn't really actually take on what they say. It suggests, though, that they were coerced, but they don't say how. And um, there's... By the um, way, I, I love that, that video, how the, how the cylinder was just given this nice little place to be tucked in on the bed, but the bed wasn't broken somehow by it. That was just kind of one of the... Yes, well, and this report says that it's quite... They say it's conceivable that at, this, at the other location, location four, which is not where the, vi where the victims were, at location four, they say it's totally conceivable that the cylinder could have gone through the roof, bounced off the floor and onto the bed. Um, and they claim to have found some ways that that's possible. When everyone who looks at that knows how ridiculous it is, the idea that a cylinder could penetrate a roof, hit the floor, and magically bounce onto a bed. So bounce onto a bed, and then Elliot Higgins came in and read Curious George to it until it was <laughs> snug and fell asleep. <laughs> and, and just one last thing. So th th that, then there's the issue of the chemical samples, which I'm going to have to uh, you know, read in depth because I only skimmed it. But I did notice that they, I believe they've claimed to find have found a new sample that I hadn't heard of before, which is a sample of concrete. And they say that this sample uh, was given to them by a third party. It wasn't collected by the OPCW on the ground. And the reason I'm raising this now is because the most recent article I've done for the Gray Zone about this is about how the OPCW relied on the white helmets to collect samples for them. And in the process, completely violated the OPCW's own rules, which was, as they stated very clearly, that the OPCW will not use samples that the OPCW doesn't collect itself. And what was interesting about Duma is that this was the first time that an OPCW team actually got on the ground to collect samples. But now, and unless I'm missing something, this is the first time I'm seeing that actually in the Duma probe as well, they relied on a third party to collect a sample and they claim to have verified the chain of custody, which is completely inconsistent with their own policies, which is that the only chain of custody that they would have, that they're supposed to allow is a sample that they collect themselves and not from somebody else, especially a actor like the White Helmets, which is funded by the same states that are accusing Syria of a chemical attack and that works with the sectarian death squads that others have accused of staging this chemical incident. And, and they did the same thing in Khan Sheikh in 2017. There was no chain of custody. They violated their own rules. And just to drill down this point, the White Helmets were promoted to us as just an ordinary band of, of farmers and and regular guys, uh, sandwich makers, you know, just uh, you know, just your your, your average uh, guy from Peoria, Syria, who just came out to rescue children that were being bombed by the evil animal Assad and uh, <clears throat> Vladimir Hitler Putin. 
But now we're told that these farmers and sandwich makers and construction workers and average guys are actually capable of doing chemical weapons analysis and taking care of highly sensitive samples and providing them to the multilateral organization that is technically placed in charge of assessing and, and, and providing attribution for these attacks. And so this should be a massive scandal, but it seems like you're one of the only journalists who are still beating this horse they want to die. <laughs> yeah. And they even gave the white helmets a name, the chemical sample unit. And they got ha the CSU. It. It's like, it's like a show, you know, yeah, the yeah, CSU. Yeah. It, it, it's so corrupt. And um, they, and speaking of the white helmets, I mean, they're a sectarian organization that hung out with death squads. They were yeah, like that, the that mass unit for Al Qaeda that celebrated when Al Qaeda took over Idlib. Um, yeah. And that one Al Qaeda leader uh, called the hidden soldiers of the revolution. So the hidden yeah. soldiers, the hidden the Mujahideen. Yes, the, 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 the hidden soldiers of the Mujahideen in Syria are now collecting samples for the OPCW. That's basically what this comes down to. And um, speaking of which, you know, we know of, thanks to Riam Delati, who was a reporter for the BBC, he said that he conducted a multi-month investigation. And he says that without a doubt, he can prove that the hospital scene uh, in Duma, where the White Helmets put out video of them hosing down uh, young children who they claim were victims of a chemical attack. Riam Zlati said he can prove without a doubt that that scene was staged. And the White Helmets were the ones who put out that video, so they're the ones who staged it. This new IIT report doesn't address the hospital except in passing mention. So you have claims out there that this hospital scene was staged, and there's no effort made here to investigate that, just as there is no effort made to interview all those Syrians who were at that hospital who claimed that it was staged and who claimed that they were basically used as tools for a propaganda video. And the way the, the only way that the OPCW tries to get around that is to suggest, just suggest that all these people were coerced without, without offering any evidence whatsoever. So there'll be a lot more on this. I'm still processing all the details and going through it. It will take me a while, but we will have a lot more on this at the gray zone very soon. Well, I hope the White Helmets chemical sample unit will be sent to the home of Paul Pelosi because the body cam footage was just released and uh, we need some real professionals on the scene. And let me say one more thing, Max. In, if you read all the media accounts of this so far, there is one common theme. There is a refusal to even acknowledge the existence of the OPCW leaks and the whistleblowers who challenged the cover-up. You can't even acknowledge that this happened. So imagine this. You have this organization making a claim now that Syria committed a chemical attack in Douma. But previously, you've had members of the original team that went to Douma saying that their investigation was covered up. And now in media reports, such as in the Wall Street Journal, in their article on this new OPCW report, they don't even mention the fact. Forget endorsing what the whistleblowers say, just, uh, but just the fact that they allege it, that there was a massive cover-up. Now, why would you not want to at least acknowledge that this accusation has been made? I'm not saying you have to agree with what the whistleblower said, but you can't even acknowledge that this happened. That's a huge omission, and it speaks to how inconvenient the reporting that we've done on these leaks is because the leaks are so damning. They show what a major act of deception took place in Duma, yeah. and this new report is the latest chapter in that, and every media outlet that doesn't even acknowledge the whistleblowers and the leaks, which are all available at wikileaks.org. Many of them also have been... Uh, uh, reported by us at the gray zone uh, any media organization any media organization that doesn't even mention the opcw whistleblowers and the leaks is complicit in this cover-up well and we have a terrible wall street journal article by my old friend jared malson I, I should reach out to him you had an exchange with him aaron but it's par for the course with the uh, mainstream media is they just don't even report on these leaks. They don't even mention that there are inspectors who are from the fact finding mission who said that their initial report was suppressed. I just, it's just a, a propaganda by omission. And, it, and I think why is, why is it so important that we're talking about a five-year-old incident? Because we're dealing with the same sort of cover-ups in Ukraine and there will be, more in other theaters, and they're conducted through supposedly multilateral organizations that have been captured by the United States. The UK is taking an important role in covering up Duma and in trying to influence the OPCW. And then they have their uh, organizations that they fund, like 
Bellingcat. So we we talked last week about this incident in Dnipro in Ukraine, where an apartment building was bombed, and it's reported still, and it's still they're they're still running with it. When the New York Times, Washington Post it was front page on the New York Times that a Russian missile targeted this apartment building, that they're deliberately trying to terrorize Ukrainian civilians into submission. And you have Alexei Arstovich, the now former spinmeister of Vladimir Zelensky, saying, well, that wasn't a targeted attack. It was actually a Ukrainian SAM missile battery that struck a Russian missile that was heading towards a military target, presumably, and it came down on the apartment building. Um, so it's not the same level of cover up and deception. But it's just the omission of the U.S. media that they won't even report that people in Zelensky's inner circle are saying that their story is not being reported accurately. And kind of on that note, um, I feel like I have to correct the record on some allegations that were made about me by probably the most, I would say, internationally known or important NATO mercenary who's been in Ukraine training Ukrainian forces and fighting on the front lines. That's Colonel Andy Milburn. Um, he was interviewed, I guess, two days ago by Going Underground, our friend Afshin Ratanzi's show. And he accused me of essentially fabricating uh, the following footage, which we refer to here at Gray Zone as Whiskey Gate. Um, let's take a look at that footage for those of you who didn't see it this is colonel andy milburn of the mozart group the mozart group is sort of uh, uh, named as a response to the wagner group uh the russian private mercenary firm that's been extremely active especially around the bakhmut area in ukraine and so colonel andy Mil milburn a former u.s marine went into ukraine with lots of money and his forces to try to counter the Wagner group and got a lot of positive publicity. But um, I was watching him on this kind of military groupie podcast where they drink whiskey the whole time. They drink like craft whiskey. I don't even know if it's craft whiskey, but uh, he got loaded. He got completely sauced and then he let his mask slip. And so I put together some highlights or lowlights in this two minute and 20 second video, it went completely viral, has almost 1 million views right now, and uh, did some damage to his reputation. Society, the let, you know, so I'm not, it's a corrupt, fucked up society. I'm talking about Ukraine. Let, you know, so I'm not, I'm not a big fan of uh, Ukraine. You can hear him, He's his, his voice this is, is uh, slurred. Buffalo Trace. Okay. Um, okay. Buffalo Trace is not that great. And the, and the Ukrainians are in violation of um, the Hague Convention. They, they, there is a, I forget the exact phraseology, but it is, we, we looked at this closely and it's, uh, yeah, they, they should be no filming of uh, the, the phrase, the, the terminology is bringing attention, blah, 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 to media. Um, and yes, the Ukrainians are violating that. You know, I absolutely there's they and and there are they're filming of a number of things that they're doing with uh uh POWs is violating law of law of armed conflict and he can't guys right killing Russian prisoners is right and it's interesting <laughs> because guys. in the past in you know you know you like Latin America or whatever. If U.S. Uh, forces or employees were involved with any force that committed, you know, yeah. atrocities or, right or whatever, back, right? you have to. Yeah, yeah you're yeah. done. Yeah. But we're obviously not going to pull our support from Ukraine at this well, point. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, you know, these violations. Oh, it's atrocities. No, yeah. I mean, it still is. I mean, you, you shouldn't kill. You shouldn't kill dudes who. I mean, everyone knows who surrendered. I mean, um, and that, and now there, there was plenty of that. But my point is, it's not about there was Ukraine. plenty of that. We're not like I happen to have, you know, Ukraine flag tied to my bag, but I'm not. Oh, my God, Ukraine's so awesome. No, because <laughs> I understand that there are plenty of fucked up people running Ukraine. It's not about that. It's about global norms. Right. 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 
What's about Putin? It's like right. allowing it, dudes in the 21st century like Putin right. to do what they want to do. It's a just fight. Yeah, yeah, it is. I love and when mercenaries like talk about. Uh, I love when mercenaries talk about global norms. It's like you know, let me listen to Joe Camel talk about respiratory health or something. It's he he, he essentially forgot the camera was on. Colonel Andy Milburn and said, first of all, Ukraine is a sick society. He's not, even though in the media, he's been presented in the New York Times as having got, gotten over this midlife crisis of having participated in Iraq and Afghanistan and really lost his mojo and uh, become disillusioned in Ukraine. He started to find a, a country and a people and a military force that he truly believed in. And then he discounts that and says, it's not really about Ukraine because their leadership is sick. And then he openly divulges that the troops that presumably are fighting under his watch have been committing atrocities. And he says, guys, guys, you can't just shoot POWs. And we've seen video after video of Russian POWs being shot in the knees, being executed on camera. So, including by the Georgian Legion, which has fought alongside, which includes many U.S. mercenaries. So that was damaging for Andy Milburn. It's also just kind of hilarious. And so Andy Milburn, through his Mozart group, responded to me. Uh, and it wasn't a very uh, accurate response. So they responded <laughs> in Ukrainian because obviously he needs to reassure his Ukrainian quote unquote partners that he doesn't hate them or think they're sick. And they put together this weird graphic, too, of me. Um, you know, here's me and um, Margarita Simonian, the head of RT, and, you know, Vladimir Putin's behind us. He's like the dark Sith Lord animating the whole thing. I'm much younger there. I don't mind that they use an old photo of me when my face was more taut. Um, but here's the translation. A month ago, American journalist Max Blumenthal published a deep fake video of an interview he had with Andy Milburn, CEO of the Mozart Group. So like every word of that, including the periods and the dashes are lies. <laughs> those aren't words. Those are, I guess, but you know what I'm saying? Everything is a lie. It's not a deep fake. A deep fake is when you use AI technology to impute words to some person that they never said to essentially animate a public figure and make them say things they didn't say. I don't have the technical capacity to do that, but I never would have done it anyway. But there was no deep fake there. There was deep drinking. There was deep <laughs> Buffalo Trace. There was deep Lafroyac. <laughs> Maybe and they meant to spell deep trace, not deep, deep trace. trace. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> uh, so, yeah. And then he, they said uh, an interview he claimed he had with Andy Milburn. I never claimed I had an interview with Andy Milburn. The, he was talking to these military groupie guys. Uh, I, I guess they were veterans too. I think everyone could see that. So the gray zone didn't. Under their theory, you, you basically created a video where you pose as two different versions of yourself. Like, Yeah. I, so some, you, you, were, you, you were both those guys that he was talking to? In the video, I guess. Yeah, the guy to the right was really spaced out. He looked like he had some P PTSD or something. And then, you know, I was also like the balding kind of veteran dad in his man cave with like a paunch from, you know, IPA. Um, so then here, the, the, it gets that's crazier. Two, it says two crazy errors in the first tweet. Uh, they, they say the deep fake and that it was an interview you did. Neither of which is true. Okay, but that's two. So it gets crazier. In the video, Andy slurred his words. Wait, so he slurred his words, but it's a deep fake. So I, so my AI, Andy, slurred his words, describing his feelings about the war in Ukraine with a somewhat pro-Russia stance. It took several weeks for a detailed examination. Hmm. So he had a pro-Russia stance. I, I, I honestly, I didn't hear anything pro-Russia. He just said that like Ukraine is a corrupt, sick society. I think many Ukrainians would agree with that. It's so I funny. Mean, They're calling that pro-Russia. But I'm also, hey, that. props to AI for being able to slur words. Yeah. You know, that's uh, that's impressive what technology can do. <laughs> I mean, he the, Andy Milburn presu presumably approved of this messaging. Yeah, and, and they're basically they're basically saying that his words were pro-Russian. So he's signing off on that. He's like, I got drunk and got pro-Russian. So I just <laughs> got Putin in my brain. And... <laughs> This is this is Putin Trace. 
wouldn't it be vodka then that he would be drinking? I don't know. Yeah. All right. So this is the, the crazy one. And they link to this video manipulation, the subtle art of taking things out of context. So if I subtly, subtly took something out of context, that would be very different from a deep fake. Anyway, this is the translation. This video made by the real hosts of the interview shows what Blumenthal had to do to create a fake for his Russian masters. Okay, so I had to watch this video under orders from the GRU, Russia's military intelligence unit, in order to be able to put together what I actually did in about five minutes on Twitter. <laughs> okay, and it gets even crazier. This is the best one. I, I don't know if Mozart has like a PR firm, but nobody's seen this. It only has 50 views. Max Blumenthal. They spelled me wrong. Google him. So don't Google Max Blumenthal. Google my correctly spelled name, lived in Russia for several years. And he and his Russian wife used to work for RT and Sputnik. Obviously, this attempt to tarnish Mozart's reputation is yet another proof that the organization's activities are interfering with plans. So for, I mean, they're saying that they're so effective and they're interfering with Russia's war plans so effectively that I was tasked by Russian intelligence with creating this deep fake video <laughs> and that I'd spent years in Russia with my Russian wife and that I'm deeply loyal to that society. <laughs> I, I have not spent years in Russia. I spent maybe two and a half days there. Um, my, I don't have a Russian wife, but my wife's name is Anya. So maybe that's why they got that. Although her last name is a common or fairly common name in the Kerala region of India and in Southern India. So they could have actually done some research, I guess. I don't know. Their targeting capabilities aren't very strong, but they just completely made that, that up. And uh, yeah, I didn't work for RT and Sputnik. My wife used to, uh, she was a correspondent and anchor for RT America until 2018. Uh, so for five years, she's been completely independent. Uh, and we have no contact with or connection to Russia in any way. Um, so that's Andy Milburn's response. And I'll be, and, you know, I, I also issued a sort of formal statement to uh, going underground that, um, Andy Milburn, you know, needs to stop chasing the Ukraine aid gravy train and get back on the wagon. Uh, so, well, and Mozart definitely needs to follow their own advice and Google you because if they had actually Googled you, they wouldn't have found uh, any trace of evidence for all the claims that they made, including. The well, there's all this fake evidence out there that was created by a bunch of neocons who are connected to U.S. intelligence. And right. I mean, look at our Wikipedia page. Right. Yeah. My Wikipedia page says I'm a regular contributor to RT and Sputnik. Mm. I haven't been on Sputnik in so long. I can't even remember. And if I go on RT, you know, it's just on my own. It's just like the way I give an interview anywhere else. And I do it like maybe at once a month at best once every two weeks, but I'm not, you know, a regular contributor. It says that. And there's, and then it, from there, it just pr proceeds to paint me as some Holocaust denying pro Putin Unabomber who, I mean, it's just an exercise in the vandalism of my reputation. The same with the gray zone Wikipedia page. I don't know if you have a Wikipedia page. Yeah, I do. Uh, and for a while uh, it called me a conspiracy theorist or something. And, yeah. uh, but that, but uh, you know, there are people on Wikipedia who try to have some, you know, semblance of truth and accuracy and so I, I i think that smear of me was taken out but of course there's obviously people making a huge effort to smear us on those pages and that's you know and no that's the point of wikipedia it's a bulletin yeah. board for the elite and the national security state there are less than three thousand editors who actually have access to it and jimmy wales the ceo has explicitly denounced the gray zone and and says we're a you know, pro-Russian propaganda site or something. Right. And he's he's involved with all those national security groups. He's on the board of NewsGuard, which gave us a red rating. It's funded by the Pentagon and the State Department. I mean, after the Twitter leaks, I would love to see some rebel billionaire buy Wikipedia and do what 
Elon did because <laughs> it would expose a whole lot. That's what they do to us in, in this society and our managed democracy. And I guess this will bring up like one other thing I wanted to discuss uh, before we get into the tanks. But this is what they do to us is there's no need to just gun us down on the street or have some, you know, hired squad of thugs beat us into into a pulp. You just destroy our reputations on Wikipedia. It's very easy, easy. And then when you Google my name, the first thing that comes up to the right is Wikipedia. It's a picture of me from like over 10 years ago on RT. Um, it's designed to kind of make me look weird. And you, you know, you, let's, let's say you went to high school with me. You're like, I wonder what Max Blumenthal is doing. Oh my God. He's a, a Russian propagandist who hates the Jews. Can't believe it. So that's the whole, that, and, and, it, and it effectively silos us. It isolates us from mainstream media and polite society just with one Google search, which is why they said Google him. They just couldn't spell my name. And with, with you as well. And um, I think one of the few ways we have of actually overcoming these artificial boundaries of isolation is through Twitter to actually punch back against mainstream media to actually, you know, comment. And so what, what I think happened has happened with you more and more, Aaron, is you were destroying the Russiagate narrative and you would comment on threads with lots of mainstream media, blue check marks who are pushing all these lies. And then they would get really upset and be like, oh, this guy. But they would never respond to you on the merits. And now they just kind of ignore you uh, because there's nothing they can say. Well, the OPCW story is a good example. For all the hate I've gotten for covering that, there's zero articles refuting anything I've ever said. Not a single word. Nothing. So for all the names I get called and all the times people who don't like me declare that I'm wrong, they can't point to one source to actually refute anything I said. That's why you remember when the Guardian regurgitated that uh, that study or so-called study from a uh, NATO state-funded think tank saying that I spread disinformation about Syria. That study couldn't identify one example of my alleged disinformation, nothing. In fact, it didn't even say that I've ever said anything false. It just said that I spread disinformation, but couldn't point to one example. So that's just how it is. And look, you know, speaking of intimidation tactics, uh, let me ask you about what just happened to you and other voices in London, where there was supposed to be this event, right, to talk about the proxy yeah. war in Ukraine. And now twice the organizers or the hosts have been intimidated into canceling the event. Yeah. Uh, well, here's a report from Morningstar UK, uh, which is a one of the few good anti-war papers left in the world. Freedom of speech fears as Conway Hall cancels no to NATO event after intimidation. Speakers due to address a no to NATO, no to war rally on February 25th in London have warned that freedom of speech is under threat after the iconic Conway Hall venue was pressed into canceling the booking. The event, which was to be addressed by members of European Parliament, Claire Daly and Mick Wallace, former members of British Parliament, Chris Williamson and George Galloway and a range of journalists and campaigners, including me, is now seeking a replacement venue. So Conway Hall, which is, a, and I, as, as this article indicates, an iconic venue, which has a long history of hosting anti-war events, is where actually Jeremy Corbyn's parents met at one such event, said that they had to cancel the event because of a, quote, unprecedented backlash against against it and an onslaught of increasingly intimidating emails and social media posts. Regretfully, we have taken the decision that Conway Hall can no longer host your event as we are now unable to ensure the safety of our building and our staff on and offline. The online detractors were actively seeking to contact our funders, partners, and hires. So we were cowards and we bowed out because we're afraid. And safety is just such a a meaningless word at this point. A lot of people feel unsafe because of the violence of words or the violence of tweets or the violence of emails, but they're not willing to actually stand up for a cause that Conway Hall traditionally represented, which is to take on the war state and to take on the regime. And you know, what's so funny about this is that so many of the people who uh, have been attacking Conway Hall are, are the kind of people that would denounce Russia or any other official enemy 
as autocratic, authoritarian, or undemocratic and point to the lack of institutions that are willing to or able to stand up against the so-called regime. And then here you have in the supposedly democratic liberal West, one institution after another caving under online pressure before the regime. There is no institution, no major institution I can think of in this society in the United States, in the UK, or in the collective West, which is willing to stand up to the regime and play host to an event like this with credible and important anti-war voices taking on NATO and a war that is escalating to the point where we are now considering the possibility of nuclear retaliation or a nuclear exchange. So this perfectly lifts a mask on the fraud of democracy in the West. And it plays into exactly what I was saying before about how democracy is managed in the West. It, we, we need to maintain this democratic veneer. We can't just openly come out and be a one party state. But if you actually challenge the regime, you will face such an onslaught that you will never be heard from. And you'll, ha you'll basically have to retire to a small corner of the internet to do what we're doing right now. And I've experienced this so many times in the past few years when I've tried to speak about my work and the work that we're doing at the gray zone. And then the problem for us is because we have limited time and resources. Now we have to devote time and energy to making the case for why we should speak and refuting all the dumb lies that are put out there to try to justify censoring us rather than just having a debate an intellectually honest discussion of whatever issues we want to discuss, whether it's Ukraine proxy war or Syria or anything else we cover. Uh, and yeah. this is how they operate. They just, they tie us up with fights over the right to air our reporting. Uh, and that changes the focus from the reporting itself. And this is just, this just goes on. And just one quick final point, and I'll show the list of speakers. Um, you know, David Miller, so you see him at close to the bottom. We've had him on before. He was he's been you know drummed out of his university under attack by neoconservative and pro-war elements. So many of these figures have come under enormous attack. But one thing, one common thread is that so many of them were on Paul Mason's mind map of the Russia China influence operation in London that he was creating for Andy Price, his apparent handler in the British security state who works in the foreign office and deals with what he calls disinformation, which is actually just official censorship. So these figures have all been targeted officially. And the way this played out was through proxy, you know, through NAFO, the North Atlantic Fellows Organization, this troll farm that Alex Rubenstein has covered for us, took credit for it. But they're, they're just basically acting on behalf of the state, but doing so kind of organically. Um, and it's depressing. As I said, I've experienced this for years. My event here at the main political bookstore in DC, Politics and Prose, was suspended indefinitely under pressure from the same kind of elements because of the book, what the book was saying about Duma and the dirty war in Syria. Uh, and it was an organized campaign. And then our event, Aaron, in Portugal at the Web Summit, same exact elements running through Bellingcat, the Atlantic Council, and including the wife of Vladimir Zelensky, Olena Zelenska. So that's, that's what we're up against. But the event will go on. It will go on somewhere. And I'll, I'll be there. I'll be participating one way or another on February 25th. And yeah. We need when we need this this kind of activity right now. We need a broad tent of anti-war activism because this proxy war is entering an extremely dangerous new phase where the level of American involvement is so extreme that I don't even know if we can even continue to call it a proxy war, Aaron. Hmm. That's a fair point. Well, let's get to it. So Germany has just announced this week a uh, deployment or a shipment of its Leopard or Leopard tanks to Ukraine. Now, Germany had resisted this move for a long time. I had previously 
said that it would never take such a step because it was deemed too escalatory. Uh, but then it came under heavy pressure. And the deal that was finally reached was that Germany would send its tanks if the U.S. promised to send its tanks as well. And just up until a few days before this announcement, the U.S. was also saying that it would be impossible to send its tanks, the M1 Abrams, because right. those tanks are too complicated for the Ukrainian battlefield. That was the reason given. But apparently a deal was reached where both sides agreed that they would send their tanks. And so Germany caved and made the announcement. And right before Germany made this announcement, the German foreign minister, Annalena Barbach, made a declaration that speaks to what you're saying, Max, that this is no longer just a proxy war, that this is an all-out war. Yeah, let's listen to Annalena Baerbach, who is the foreign minister of Germany. Uh, very revealing comments. And therefore, I have said already in the last days, yes, we have to do more to defend Ukraine. Yes, we have to do more also on tanks. But the most important and the crucial part is that we do it together and that we do not do the blame game in Europe because we are fighting a war against Russia and not against each other. Thank you. So we are fighting a war against Russia. Actually, I want to go back to that tweet uh, really quick. Uh, sorry for taking it off screen because it's really interesting what happened to it. So you can see Michael Tracy put this out first. German foreign minister declares war on Russia. I think that's a fairly accurate way of describing what she said. Yeah. And Twitter adds a context <laughs> bar. Leaders added context they thought people might want to know. The foreign minister of Germany did not and has no constitutional power to declare war. Oh, okay. Okay, so obviously the German <laughs> foreign ministry hit up Twitter and was like, oh, this is not good. She did not mean this. Because she is unprofessional. If a foreign minister's use of the phrase at war was a declaration of war, Russia would have declared war on the West a long time ago. What, what kind of a troll comment is that? So That's we should crazy. discount we so we should discount the German foreign minister saying that we're at war against Russia because Russia hasn't already said it's at war against <laughs> the West. That's what it's it seems to be saying. I'm gonna rate this. I'm gonna rate it. Was this note helpful? Somewhat. No. <laughs> no. What was unhelpful about it? Uh, it's. I mean, it's. How, how about harassment or abuse? <laughs> I, I mean, this is a, an abuse of my intelligence. Note uh, not needed. So funny. Argumentative so funny. or biased language. Misses key points, and um, incorrect. Okay. What I loved about this comment from the everyone uh, rate that um, context bar. No, <laughs> please. Okay, go ahead, Aaron. What I loved about this comment from the German foreign minister is that the mantra of French President Emmanuel Macron since the first week of Russia's invasion back in February 2022, he's always he's often said on behalf of NATO, we are not at war with Russia. We are not. And he said that multiple times because he's trying to, you know, uh, address worries in his public that we are at war against Russia. And here is the he is, you know, one of France's closest allies, Germany coming out and saying, we are at war against Russia, uh, not even being able to, to hide it. And, you know, what's interesting about this decision to send the tanks is, so Biden made this declaration, we're going to send the tanks, and he's standing next to Lloyd Austin, who had previously been, like, aggressively resisting sending the tanks. And yeah. we can speculate as to why, but the official reason was that the tanks are just too cumbersome for the Ukrainian battlefield. But regardless, the deal is, so Germany is going to send the tanks pretty soon. Um, in the next few months, although not as soon as, of course, Ukraine has been asking for. Uh, but uh, the U.S. will send its tanks sure, sure. In, Go ahead. Sorry. in many months and possibly years. So it might yeah. even take years before Ukrainian uh, forces get these tanks from the U.S., which, says to, which, which speaks to a few things, that the U.S. is not, like despite its claims to back Ukraine, it's actually not there meeting its needs. Some of these tanks are going to be built new like so they're not going to send in the existing tanks they're going to wait until new tanks are built so that they can send those in which is great for the military industrial complex because they'll make more money from orders but if you care about ukraine and their uh, professed needs it's not good for them because they say they need the tanks now and by the way uh ukraine has said it needs 300 tanks to fight russia effectively that's yeah. what Zeluzhny, the commander 
of the Ukrainian armed forces said in a recent interview with The Economist. And the tally now, even with all the, the countries unlocking the Leopard tanks and the Abrams tanks, it's still nowhere near enough. So, And then even that amount that is being uh, pledged is not going to arrive all at once. It's going to arrive over a long period of time. So we can speculate as to why this announcement is being made now and what's behind it. But certainly it's not going to have the impact on the battlefield, I think, that it's, uh, that its proponents are, are, are billing it to be. Well, there are, what, 30 M1A, I guess it's M1A2 Abrams tanks, which is a more recent kind of retrofitted tank that's going to Ukraine. There are, what, 30 of them? Yeah. 31. It's not a lot. Uh, compared to Russian tanks, obviously, they're superior to the, <laughs> they're massively superior to the T-72 and all of its upgrades. They're probably superior to the T-90. There aren't that many on the battlefield. They're going to be used in combined arms. The Ukrainian military is has been training in combined arms in Germany and other NATO states uh, to try to do a spring offensive. And that's kind of what this is all about. And there are some British military advisors who are quoted today in the Wall Street Journal about what kind of changes these tanks can make on the battlefield. And they even agree that it won't be much, but it can actually increase the attrition rate for Russians and they could be effective in a combined arms operation and they may change the Russian calculus. I think one thing they're trying to do is just that uh, to head off or interrupt the Russian offensive that they're all fearing. And it's this Russian offensive that we're seeing after the fall of Bakhmut, which appears to be imminent and is really upsetting people in Washington and the you know, the, around the Pentagon, who'd been, you know, through their media stenographers saying that Bakhmut was strategically insignificant. Now they're getting a little bit concerned. You can see the the, the worry. Not to, you can you can hear it in the in the words of Annalena Baerbach, who's saying we need to do everything we can to Ukraine. You could hear it in uh, Condoleezza Rice, Iraq War author Condoleezza Rice. And uh, Bob Gates, former CIA and defense director, in their op-ed in the Washington Post that Ukraine is in trouble. So these tanks are meant to answer Ukrainian concerns, but it also shows how much Ukraine and its uh, general staff in the military is able to push Washington around and push the Europeans around. It's pretty shocking. There's whatever, whatever they want, it rem they get. They're just like a, a spoiled sociopathic kid who asks their parents if they can bring a you know six year old kid bring if their parents can let them bring their pistol to school or something. There seems to be no limit, and now they're asking for F sixteen jets. Yes, and Lockheed Martin has already said, "Don't worry, uh, we're on. Like we're going to produce more F 16s just in case." Uh, the U.S. and its allies want to transfer existing F-16s over to Ukraine, and then we'll we'll backfill that. So so we'll back you up. So Lockheed Martin's game, and there's no reason to doubt that Ukraine will get these F-16s because the pattern so far every time has been Ukraine asks for something. At first, the U.S. says no, it's too escalatory, but ultimately they get it. Uh, the tanks are the latest example of that, and there's already talk of uh, European officials saying that the talks about sending f-16s to ukraine are in an early stage so i think it's i think it's a safe bet i wouldn't say it's a sure bet but it's a safe bet that ukraine will get the f-16s but notice how this has gone for the u.s they slowly pour these heavy weapons into ukraine i think because they have a certain strategies that they want to slowly do this because they don't want to risk a direct uh russia nato confrontation because they want to make sure that the only people dying for their proxy war are ukrainians so they yeah. slowly introduce weapons. It's like it's a slow process of boiling the frog, as it's been referred to. And the calculus is, you know, outlets like the New York Times have explained, is basically how much weapons can we send in without triggering a uh, Russian es escalation against us? So as long as we keep the fighting inside of Ukraine, we're happy to keep pouring weapons in from outside of Ukraine. Well, this will be, well, first of all, Dmitry Peskov, the spokesman for for Putin, his personal spokesman has said this demonstrates direct U.S. involvement in the war. They're not even calling it a proxy war. Mm -hmm. Now, what will be the response from the American side if potentially 
Abrams tanks are seen burning on the battlefield or F-16s are shot down. Uh, many Abrams tanks went down in Iraq against a much weaker force of insurgents. Uh, it was IEDs that were doing significant damage to U.S. armor. That's when uh, Donald Rumsfeld's infamous quote about you don't go to war with the army you want, you go to war with the army you have came. W w that's what triggered that quote was that the armor that the U.S. was sending into Iraq was not reinforced at its bottom. And so they were vulnerable to IEDs and soldiers were getting their legs blown, blown off, primarily in armored personnel carriers. But I mean, the Merkava tank is another highly advanced platform and it had a, it had a soft underbelly. And uh, Al um, uh, Qassam Brigade's forces, who are even weaker than the Iraqi insurgents, were able to take out a Merkava tank in the Gaza Strip during the Second Intifada. So I think this does definitely raise the stakes if major U.S. platforms are getting taken down by Russian weapons. Obviously, it's not American forces coming back with their legs blown off or in flag-draped coffins. But we're moving closer to a direct confrontation with Russia. And if you consider the training that's needed for these tanks and F-16s, I mean, remember, uh, maybe nine months ago, there was an attempt to try to get all these repurposed MiGs from Poland and the Baltic states because Ukrainian Air Force pilots couldn't fly American jets. So they're going to have to be trained in these sophisticated uh, in sophisticated jets, how long will that take? It means that the war planners are gaming out a really protracted conflict that could extend into 2024. They're not really interested in negotiating at all. And 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 Aaron, I mean, you were you were watching the Senate hearings yesterday, Victoria Newland. Yeah, well, we're going to get to that, but let me ask you first. So, Max, the uh, the the German foreign minister who declared that we are. Uh, in a war against Russia, Annalena Barbach. She's from the Green Party of Germany. Yeah. yeah. And it might seem out of whack for people to hear a Green Party member declaring, you know, a war on Russia. Like, what does that have to do with the Green Party? So uh, can you explain that for us? How is it that the Green Party of Germany is, is so devoted to a neocon proxy war against Russia? Well, the Green Party is one of the most hypocritical parties on the planet. The only other party I can think of that's as hypocritical is the U.S. Democratic Party and the Israeli Labor Party, um, just because they're such warmongers. Under the leadership of Gerhard Schroeder, the Green Party was different, um, and they managed to achieve power nationally through a coalition, and Schroeder was uh, more represented the, uh, the Ostpolitik of Willy Brandt, who was the... German Chancellor of West Germany at a time at the time of the height of the Cold War, and he took a position of kind of mediating the conflict between the U.S. and the Soviet Union, and listening to the concerns of the Soviet Union under Brezhnev and Gorbachev. And Schroeder then, you know, was even involved in some deals that involved Russian gas. And then the Green Party went through a, a low point. And it had a resurgence in the 2020, 20, in the 2021 federal elections with Annalena Baerbock, this young, uh, telegenic female, uh, you know, environmentalist, self-proclaimed feminist. And um, Robert Habeck, who was also an uh, ardent environmentalist pushing green energy, leading the party, but they represented the sort of moderate faction that wanted to take the party. Uh, back to national prominence. And that meant betraying pretty much all of their campaign promises. They won 15%, as I point out here in this thread, in the federal elections in 2021 and came into power through the um, in, co in coalition with the SPD of Olaf Scholz, which won 25%. And the funny thing is, well, I mean, this is first of all, a commentary on German democracy or the lack thereof, that a party that wins 15% gets to install a foreign minister who, I mean, just look at Annalena Baerbock. She's so much like Sana Marin or these characters, these World Economic Forum characters that are brought up in the mold of Hillary Clinton, 
who are complete warmongers who never seen the face of battle, who have never been on the battlefield, probably can't even shoot a weapon and are just the embodiment of liberal hypocrisy. But winning 15% of the vote, you get a foreign minister who unilaterally declares war on Russia, just gets to say that unilaterally. And you have Robert Habeck, who is an environmentalist, who, as I point out here, winds up bowing to the, to, uh, the Qatari trade minister on a trip to Doha. Why? Because they cut off all of the energy from Russia the U.S. blew up the Nord Stream pipeline. It obviously did with no protest from the foreign minister or Haba. And all of those green sources of energy can't fill the gap. So they have to go begging for fossil fuels. And the German coal industry experiences a renaissance. They're bringing coal-fired plants back online after the Green Party took them off. And the Green Party, so foolish that they also re reject nuclear energy, which is carbon-free. So... Michael Tracy made some really interesting points as well about the Green Party that they ran in 2021 by deceiving their own voters. Green, German Green Party manifesto in the 2021 election called for banning export of arms and military equipment into war zones. Ukraine is a war zone. They won 118 seats on this pledge, entered the ruling coalition, and are now the government's most hardcore proponents of exporting arms into war zones. And here's, you know, Tracy... Uh, excerpts a piece of the green platform. Here's a quote. Germany should be a driving force in the political de-escalation of conflict. The Green Party manifesto reads, raising the question of whether the party now views leopard tanks as new cutting edge political de-escalation devices because the Green Party is now under Baerbach and Habeck, the most forceful supporters of sending these tanks to Ukraine. Uh, they call for disarmament in the manifesto. And they call for a feminist foreign policy, adoption of which is mandatory. But those are sort of empty words because as we know from the propaganda we got on the need to go into Afghanistan, waging war on Afghan farmers with drones, F-16s and tanks and constant surges was being done to save Afghan women from their own people. So... This, is, this could be read as sort of a R2P humanitarian interventionist language, but the point is the Green Party are one of the most hypocritical parties in the world, and they are driving Germany into a state of war that takes it past the post-war Rubicon and where most German voters want to go or ever thought they would go. Annalena Baerbach is the most militaristic German foreign minister since Ribbentrop. Yeah. And the symbolism, not just of, you know, German tanks going uh, into Ukraine to once again fight Russia, uh, as happened in World War Two, but German tanks being uh, sent to Ukraine to support a military that is formally incorporated a neo-Nazi battalion in its <laughs> ranks, the Azov battalion. I mean, the first part, the World War Two analogy we're allowed to mention, people talk about that, but what they don't mention is the even, I think, more damning irony that Germany is arming a military that has incorporated neo-Nazis. It doesn't yeah. mean the entire Ukrainian military is neo-Nazis, but there is a neo-Nazi element. Uh, we were once allowed to acknowledge that. The New York Times used to call the Azov Battalion openly a neo-Nazi. Now they're just the Azov Battalion or even the celebrated Azov Battalion. So that's a fact. <laughs> and the New York and, Times called them the celebrated Azov Battalion. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. So that's a fact. And that's just one more aspect of the dangers here of you know, uh, arming a neo-Nazi infested army. That's where we're at. And on the topic of Nord Stream 2, we've just had what I think is another admission of guilt from the U.S. Uh, in terms of who was responsible for bombing that pipeline and sabotaging it because Victoria Nuland, the top U.S. State Department official, uh, well known for her role in the 2014 U.S.-backed Maidan coup when she was caught on tape plotting with the U.S. ambassador who would be the next Ukrainian leader, um, she testified at a Senate hearing, uh, and she came under questioning by Ted Cruz and Ted Cruz was angry at Newland and the Biden administration because Ted Cruz was trying to make the case that had the Biden administration agreed to impose the sanctions he wanted on the Nord Stream two gas pipeline between Germany and Russia that had those sanctions gone through, then Russia in his view would not have invaded Ukraine. And he was trying to get Newland to admit to this. And the reason why this has been such a passion project for people like 
Ted Cruz and other neocons is this has nothing to do with a Russian invasion of Ukraine because well before this, they've been trying to kill the Nord Stream 2 because they all recognize that if Germany and Russia have closer energy ties, then that will threaten the supremacy of the U.S. because it's been a long time goal. And we're going to talk more about this in a second. It's been a long time U.S. goal to sever any kind of relationship between Germany and Russia because if you have these two countries working together where you know Germany is the biggest power in Western Europe, the sort of economic engine of Europe, it's very difficult to wage you know destabilize, destabilization or regime change campaigns against Russia because Germany is dependent on Russia for cheap energy. And so there's been a long time attempt to kill the Nord Stream 2 to prevent closer energy ties. And that took a major step forward when finally Germany canceled the Nord Stream 2 around the time of Russia's invasion. But just to make sure, a few months ago, the Nord Stream 2 was bombed. And Victoria Nuland was asked about this by Ted Cruz. And this is how she responded. Whoops. Senator Cruz, uh, like you, I am, and I think the administration is very gratified to know that Nord Stream 2 is now, as you like to say, a hunk of metal at the bottom of the sea. Senator Cruz, watch uh, that again. Like you, I am, and I think the administration is very gratified to know that Nord Stream 2 is now, as you like to say, a hunk of metal at the bottom of the sea. So there it is. And before I actually, uh, comment on that. Just a quick correction about something I said earlier. Gerhard Schrader was uh, SPD, but came to power thanks to uh, support from the Greens and was in coalition with the Greens. So we'll edit that in post. Um, uh, Victoria Newland is basically saying we did it in so many ways. And we were told, Aaron, that the Russian military did this somehow, or that Russian intelligence did this somehow. When I Googled who blew up the Nord Stream pipeline? Google told me the Russian Federation. <laughs> so, so I guess Victoria Nuland's just happy that Putin blew up his own pipeline here. She's just patting Putin on the back. Maybe they conspired. You know, maybe maybe we need Robert Mueller on the case because if if Russia did yeah. it, if Russia had bombed the pipeline, but Victoria Nuland and the Biden administration are happy about it, that means their interests are aligned. So maybe they conspired and we, we need a new Mueller investigation. Yeah, that's a that's an admission of guilt. I mean, there have been many others, uh, starting with Anthony Blinken, who right after the Nord Stream 2 pipeline was bombed, he called it a tremendous strategic opportunity. And we have the clip if we want to watch and, it. And, and well, yeah, yeah, we'll play that. But it's also, you know, speaking of strategic opportunity, she's under questioning by Ted Cruz, senator from Texas, gets a lot of his funding from Houston and Dallas from the LNG industry, from the domestic oil and gas industry in the U.S., which is filling the gap for Europe and making a ton of money. So this has been a great opportunity for U.S. oil producers. Um, That's another interest I forgot to mention. You're exactly right. So killing the Nord Stream 2 makes Germany need to go elsewhere for energy sources. And they've where they've turned so far is to U.S. LNG, which has been selling it to Germany and Europe at like a four time markup, like a like 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 four times the price uh, of LNG is what Germany and others have been paying for it because it's expensive to ship it across the Atlantic Ocean. That's why it makes right. no sense for it to be happening in the first place. And that's why they had to bomb the Nord Stream 2 pipeline just to make sure that Germany doesn't come to its senses and turns back to Russia. Yeah, I mean, the Baerbach's predecessor, Steinmeier, was adamant about building Nord Stream 2 because the it would just be so much more expensive to get gas shipped over. I mean, it just didn't make practical sense. Yeah, I always saw it as a peace pipeline. I mean, we don't want Germany and Russia to be fighting. That's what we saw during World War II. And now, well, yeah, people like Tony Blink Blinken, who I call Tony Blinkskrieg, they do. Yeah, And here's one reason why. Ultimately, um, this is also a tremendous opportunity. It's a tremendous opportunity to once and for all remove the dependence on Russian energy and thus to take away from uh, Vladimir Putin the weaponization of energy as a means of advancing uh, his uh, imperial designs. Uh, that's very significant, and, and that offers tremendous um, strategic opportunity for, um, for the years to come. But meanwhile, we're determined to do everything we possibly can uh, to make sure that the consequences of all of this are not borne by 
citizens in our countries or for that matter around the world. And we're going to start by selling you our gas at a quadruple factor markup. That's how we're going to help you out. Yeah. You're welcome. Uh, and uh, Tony Blinken's first, his, his, his um, I think it was his graduate thesis was on uh, the Siberian pipeline crisis. I want to bring that up really. Here it is. Ally versus ally. Um, the Siberian pipeline crisis was over the CIA bombing a Soviet pipeline from uh, from uh, the from the Arctic region, I believe. And Tony Blinken thanked in his book Richard Pipes. I read the acknowledgments. I didn't have time to dig into the book, but he thanked in his book Richard Pipes, who's the father of Daniel Pipes and was one of the hardcore Kremlinologists who was pushing for heightened conflict with the Soviet Union. He referred to him as kind of a mentor. But I mean, Blinken's first book is on a very remarkably similar, eerily similar incident. And as such, his commentary there was just so cynical about this being a tremendous opportunity. And before Victoria Newland's comments, Aaron, the US, USAID's chief administrator for Eastern Europe, I think her name is Erin McKee, spoke. And she was touting all of the efforts that USAID is making along with presumably U.S. corporations to bring alternative energy sources to places like Moldova and the Baltic states and all of these other countries that are impacted by the shutoff in Russian gas. So basically what she's saying is we're hooking up corporate America in these regions where we have cut off a much cheaper support uh, source of gas. And people there are, in the meantime, suffering. Yeah, and uh, Victoria Newland during this hearing also mentioned speaking to her contacts in Europe who have told her that their energy bills are now three times higher. And Newland's conclusion of that was that this is a good example of why you know Europe is waking up to the fact that they can't depend on Russian energy. But what cut off Russian energy was U.S. sanctions and a U.S. decision to reject any pre-invasion diplomacy yeah. And to basically opt for a, for a proxy war. And um, the fact that friends of hers are suffering energy bills that are three times of, as high doesn't seem to, she doesn't seem to make the connection between policies she's pushed, her desire to break Europe from Russian energy, and the fact they're not paying higher bills. Right. Right. Well, you got attacked by some NATO apparatchik for, pub, for um, merely showing what George Friedman of the private CIA Stratfor said. Uh, back in 2015, about uh, the primordial interest of severing the relationship between Germany and Russia. I thought it'd be, he, he said, you know, he referred to the propaganda of Aaron Mate. I don't know if you saw that. I did see that. And he said something about how it's like a threat to Europe or something like that. Yeah, that you threaten Europe and that you hate America <laughs> for publishing this clip of George Friedman. I mean, this is just, this is just what, George Friedman of Stratfor said, which is so relevant right now. So the primordial interest of the United States over which for a century we have fought wars, the first, second cold war has been the relationship between Germany and Russia because United, they are the only force that could threaten us and to make sure that that doesn't happen. Therefore, it's not an accident that General Hodges, who's been appointed to be blamed for all of this, uh, is talking about pre-positioning troops in Romania, Bulgaria, Poland, and the Baltics. This is the intermarium, the, from the Black Sea to the Baltic yeah. that Pilsudski dreamt of. This is, yep. this is the solution for the United States. The issue to which we don't have the answer is what will Germany do? So the real wild card in Europe is that as the United States builds this cordon sanitaire, not in Ukraine, but to the West, and the Russians try to figure out how to leverage the Ukrainians out, we don't know the German position. Germany is in a very peculiar position. Its former uh, chancellor, Gerhard Schroeder, is on the board of Gazprom. Uh, they have a very complex relationship as I mentioned with before. the Russians. The Germans themselves don't know what to do. 
They must export. The Russians can't take up the export. On the other hand, if they lose the free trade zone, they need to build something different. For the United States, the primordial fear is Russian capital, Russian technology, I mean, German technology and German capital, Russian uh, natural resources, uh, Russian manpower as the only combination that has for centuries scared the hell out of the United States. So how does this play out? Well, the U.S. has already put its cards on the table. It is the line from the Baltics to the Black Sea. And, and he goes on to say, and his next line is, Russia's cards on the table are that they need a Ukraine that is not pro-Western, that it's at least neutral. So yeah. in his words, the U.S. wants to control what he calls, quote, the line from the Baltics to the Black Sea. Okay, Russia, by contrast, they, their main goal is to keep Ukraine neutral because if Ukraine falls into the uh, Western orbit, then that seriously weakens them and also seriously threatens their prospects of having uh, you know, friendly ties with Germany. So he is openly declaring back in 2015 that re- what so much of this is about, it's not about Ukraine, um, it's not about uh, curbing Russian aggression, it's about severing any kind of relationship between Germany and Russia. And again, notice how he doesn't talk about a military threat of Germany and Russia being united. He says, what scares the hell out of the U.S. is, uh, what was it, a German technology uh, and... Uh, German know-how and Russian manpower. And Russian manpower natural resources. That's what scares these people. And that's what this proxy war has helped um, uh, advance in terms of sabotaging German-Russia relations. And just to make sure, they blew up the Nord Stream 2 pipeline in case anybody got any second thoughts in Germany. Yeah, I think... Uh- George Friedman didn't really need Buffalo Trace or any whiskey to <laughs> be so candid. And yeah. that's sort of why we appreciate him. I mean, he speaks in a very candid manner about the Western imperial understanding of geopolitics. He distills it very well in two minutes there and provides the perfect prism for viewing or understanding the Ukraine proxy war. What he's saying, first of all, can be understood through the concept of the great world island of Eurasia, conceived by one of the godfathers of Western imperial geopolitics, the geographer Harold, Harold Mackinder, who essentially argued, this is a, you know, it's, a, it, you know, during the height of British empire, that whoever controls Eurasia with all of its resources and population controls the world. And so there needs to be an effort to fragment the Russian empire and Germany and France and keep them kind of, you know, pit, pit, pit them against one another. This was adapted into this big new Brzezinski's grand chessboard. If you want to understand Mackinder in the, in, in the context of the cold war, then read the grand chessboard by Brzezinski and what, Friedman was talking about there specifically was a concept for maintaining Western control and specifically U.S. imperial control over Eurasia, which is the intermarium. And the intermarium is the region that exists between Russia and Russia's sphere of influence and Germany. And that's Poland, Hungary, Latvia, Lithuania, the Baltic states. And Andrzej Duda, the... Polish leader, sort of a center-right, right-wing figure. He understands that very well. He talks about the intermarium constantly, and that's why he's so welcoming of NATO and volunteering Poland as a base for U.S. power projection against Russia via Ukraine. Because the concept of the intermarium was conceived by Joseph Pilsudski, who was a post-World War I Polish nationalist general, a big influence on Duda and you know, his, party, his party mates. And they essentially wanted to prevent Germany and Russia from overrunning Poland. And that meant welcoming forces like the US or the UK into their orbit. Uh, Neo-Nazis like the Azov Battalion are also very into the intermarium theory and they hold conferences in Poland and in Latvia 
where they bring together white nationalist theorists to talk about how they can use the intermarium as the base for their racial reconquista, a reconquest of the European continent in which all of the migrants and the unpure forces of liberalism are ejected. So it's all coming together through the Ukraine proxy war, but what this is about is maintaining US control via NATO of the resources of Eurasia and preventing Russia and Germany from combining forces or at least being at peace and enjoying some kind of diplomacy. And the destruction of the Nord Stream pipeline was such a key physical act of severing Germany from Russia to advance this long-term neo-colonial political project that George Friedman spells out perfectly there. So moving along, someone keeps spamming this uh, chat about Savvy Sabs. I love Savvy Sabs, but I'm going to block anyone who mentions her again. Uh, I got, I'm going to block this guy. Uh, yeah, there we go. All right. Um, so yeah, that was an interesting hearing though. I mean, it, 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 I don't know why they just aren't more, uh, did they really, you know, the, the senators on that hearing, they really don't think we're watching or I guess they don't care. I guess no, they don't care. Into, yeah, yeah, they just don't care. Cause like Bob Menendez, he's the chairman, super pro war right-wing Democrat. He just let it slip that Ukraine has been selling white phosphorus chemical weapons to Azerbaijan to use in the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict. He says they're using chemical weapons that kill Armenians. I guess he has some Armenian constituents and this is a concern of his, but this is something that Zelensky denied. And uh, well, it would seem to be a war crime. Uh, with that, uh, and we also, uh, I'm a strong supporter, have voted for everything for the Ukrainians and passed legislation going back to 2014. But we also have to tell our friends in Ukraine, you can't sell white phosphorus to the Azerbaijanis that kill Armenians. Uh, there are responsibilities. It's kind of an amazing uh, admission because in, back in November, Zelensky explicitly denied it, called it fake news and Russian propaganda. So Welcome Bob Menendez to the club of Russian propagandists. And it, it really raises questions about whether white phosphorus has been used in the Donbass in Don, against the forces in Donetsk and Lugansk, because we've seen rumors of that online. I don't know if they're true. That would be a major war crime. So welcome to everyone who's just joining to the gray zone. Um, here with my colleague Aaron Mate, and we're talking about all of these escalatory efforts in Ukraine. Um, and Aaron, the U.S. has been sanctioning everybody this week. They sanctioned officials in Paraguay. They sanctioned officials in Nigeria. Now we have the U.S. threatening Turkey. Yes, this is a new one. Uh, this has came out. This came out of the Wall Street Journal that. The U.S. is now threatening Turkey with sanctions uh, if it offers refueling and spare parts to U.S.-made planes that are flying to Russia and Belarus. And these are not military planes. They're just civilian jets. And the Wall Street Journal points out that these flights have raised serious safety concerns because the U.S. has banned any provision of the spare parts that are needed to repair Russia's civilian airline fleet. So, you know, these flights are going, uh, bringing civilians uh, from uh, you know Turkey to Russia and Belarus, and they need parts. They need repairs. The U.S. response is not to grant those repairs and parts and, and parts. It's to threaten Turkey with sanctions if it grants uh, authorization for those flights to continue. And that just shows what an ally the U.S. is, you know, and how how concerned it is for you know civilian protection around the world that it's willing to risk the lives of airline passengers and ground flights uh, just to advance its proxy war aims, which include destroying the Russian economy. Well, this is something that Iran and Iranians have been experiencing for years and years. The U.S. has explicitly sanctioned some spare parts for Iranian civilian airliners and sought to threaten civilians. And we saw this in 
Richard Nephew's book, The Art of Sanctions. Richard Nephew was the sanctions czar for the Obama administration who designed those sanctions, someone who boasted that on the holiday of Nowruz in Iran, he managed to reduce the amount of chicken that Iranians could eat. He wanted to starve them. He actually went to Russia on a visit and complained that he could get uh, fancy cheeses and uh, sort and luxury goods and said, we need to make it harder for them to be able to enjoy themselves in Russia. And now Richard Nephew has been promoted. 60 Minutes actually did a special on him. He's the sanctions coordinator for the Treasury Department, I believe, specifically targeting Russia. So this is a, a Richard Nephew initiative. His official title is Coordinator on Global Anti-Corruption. Yeah, global anti-corruption means bringing yeah. down civilian airliners. And, you know, the, the USS Vincent Vincennes uh, naval warship brought down an Iranian civilian airliner and killed hundreds of Iranians. And it may be that the Lockerbie bombing was there, there's a theory that the Lockerbie bombing was carried out by the PFLPGC, which was backed by Iran as retaliation for that assault on an Iranian civilian airliner. This is all, you know, in the historical background, but I'm just saying there's a precedent for the U S seeking to attack through sanctions and even through military means civilian airliners of its official enemies. One more victory for democracy. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Denying air parts, uh, 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 spare parts needed for, for, for civilian passenger jets. It's, uh, yeah. Um, what can you say? And, and this goes on. I mean, this will happen to anyone who just doesn't toe the line. Um, and this is why more and more countries are turning to ways to avoid dependency on the U.S. and to try to find ways to circumvent the U.S. controlled financial system, which interfere. I mean, for all the talk about how the U.S. loves capitalism and the free market, I mean, putting aside your, your, your political views, no one interferes in the so-called free market in capitalism more than the U.S., which like prevents transactions from going through if you're right. in a bad guy state, denies you the parts you need to repair planes, uh, denies you the parts you need or the materials you need to make products for your people. Um, no one interferes in the state more than the Treasury Department. The I mean, that must be a really busy staff at the Treasury Department trying to coordinate all the various sanctioned regimes they have everywhere. And it grows, as you, as you say, it, it grows by the week. Yeah. It was, I mean, they have an entire department in Treasury for sanctions. And yeah, it started after 9-11, um, and it's just grown. I mean, I mean, it was really shocking to see them sanction people in Paraguay. And, and I, I guess I should mention, uh, you know, if you listen to Newland's remarks in the Senate hearing, it was interesting to hear her make anti-corruption such an issue with respect to Ukraine, because we saw a massive, another massive purge uh, within Zelensky's administration. A large number of officials were fired and accused of corruption by Zelensky. And it's obvious that he is just completely being managed by the U S right now. That was a U.S. initiative. And, uh, you know, to that point, Zelensky has also been touting a business initiative. We've been talking about this a lot about advantage Ukraine, which was, you know, his attempt to declare that Ukraine is open for business. What is this? Meanwhile, these comments that he made in a recent online speech, I don't know if he was in front of a green screen or what, um, they really put that into, they cast a pretty cynical light over Advantage Ukraine. It is obvious that American business can become the locomotive that will once again push forward global economic growth. We have already managed to attract attention and have cooperation with such giants of the international financial and investment world as BlackRock, JP Morgan, <laughs> and Golden Sachs, such American brands as Starling or Westinghouse have already become part of our Ukrainian way. Your brilliant defense systems such as HIMARS or Bradley's are already uniting our history of freedom with your enterprises we are waiting for patriots we are
are looking closely at Abrams. Thousands of such examples are possible. And everyone can become a big business by working with Ukraine in all sectors from weapons and defense to construction, from communication to agriculture, from transport to IT, from banks to medicine. And I believe that freedom must always win. Freedom meaning the free market. And uh, I joke that a day after Justin Bieber sold his catalog to Blackstone or Blackstone owned company, his fellow performer Vladimir Zelensky one upped him by selling his whole country to BlackRock. Uh, and then I, you know, in this follow up tweet, I posted a photo I, I took walking down M Street in Georgetown here in Washington, D.C. This is the Ukrainian embassy. And you can see the flag draped over the embassy features is emblazoned with the following slogan. We are free. We are strong. We are open for business. And in the upper right hand corner, it says Advantage Ukraine, which is their sort of free market debt trap privatization neoliberal initiative that Zelensky was pushing right there. And this is just an, another disturbing aspect of the American control over Ukrainian society, its public assets, its military, everything Zelensky says. I mean, he didn't write the word locomotive or locomotive. He doesn't even know that word. He has probably Americans writing his speeches um, or Ukrainian Americans. And that's what this is about. What, what did Goldman Sachs do to our economy? They were responsible for the housing crisis, the financial crash. They were what Matt Tybee correctly called the vampire squid. That they, you know, the, the asset swaps, everything they were doing leading up to the financial crash was completely criminal. And BlackRock, what have they done? They're buying up all of the distressed assets and the housing that was and, 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 and commercial real estate that was abandoned with the pandemic, and they helped devise the CARES Act, which is a giant slush fund for BlackRock via their buddy Steve Mnuchin, the former Goldman Sachs banker. So this is the cartel that's moving into Ukraine along with the MIC that he mentions. You know, He praises the HIMARS uniting us on our path to freedom, and we're looking at Abrams tanks. I think uh, if Ukraine looks bad now, it's going to be a dystopia in the post-war in the post-war situation and something that our neoliberal elites will actually use as a blueprint for other disaster zones and do his speech writer, do his speech writers not consider the optics because on the one hand they're writing speeches for him where he claims that Ukraine is suffering a genocide yeah but in this speech they're saying we're open for business yeah. So which is it? Are you going through a genocide and are we in, you know, are we facing the new Hitler or are you open for business? And of course, it's the latter because the latter reveals the agenda of uh, who Zelensky really answers to his real constituency, which is the people he's trying to suck up to here, which is Goldman Sachs and BlackRock and other global elites. That's Zelensky's actual constituency. And that's what has brought us into this proxy war. And, you know, Looking back on the recent history of Ukraine, it's sort of a consolidation of one of the main causes for this whole crisis. And that if you remember back when Yanukovych was, you know, the Ukrainian president who was overthrown, why he was overthrown? Well, he was going to sign because he campaigned on it, an agreement to bring Ukraine closer to the EU to increase trade between Ukraine and the EU. But then he read the fine print. And the fine print of the deal said, and this is in late 2013, and the fine deal of the, uh, and the fine print of the deal said that um, you have to basically cut your trade ties to Russia and other Eurasian countries. Uh, and also you have to cut subsidies in your own country. So for pensioners, uh, for heating costs, you have to cut those too because you have to accept neoliberal austerity. And Yanukovych read all this and he realized that for him this was political suicide because he'd be angering the people who had elected him. Um, and he and what the EU was offering him could no way compensate for what he was being asked to give up. So he backed off of that deal and he said, I still want to sign it. I just I just want to renegotiate it. Uh, and he said to try to get a better deal for Ukraine, I'm going to go to Russia. And his strategy was I think it was smart, although it probably didn't factor in that he was going to get cooed because of it. But his strategy was I'm going to play Russia off against the EU and the West and out of that, get the best deal possible for Ukraine. 
But it was too clever by half because what the U.S. did and the EU and and their allies and the Ukrainian far right did when Yanukovych said, I'm not going to sign this right now. They used that to encourage protests uh, and people who really genuinely wanted to be a part of the West, wanted to turn to the EU and were angry about Yanukovych's corruption. They came out and there were huge crowds at first and those crowds ultimately dissipated so that by the end of the protest, there was just a, like a mostly a, a far right nationalist contingent and those are the forces that ultimately overthrew Yanukovych and so now Zelensky coming and saying that we're going to become a neoliberal paradise that's a consolidation uh, of the process that began with the Maidan coup in 2014 and last thought on this I wish Bernie Sanders and the squad could listen to this because here at home they're happy to rail against BlackRock uh, BlackRock and Goldman Sachs and point out about how they're enemies of the working people and all that well here is Zelensky who uh, they 100% support in terms of funding the proxy war that he is waging on our behalf, saying that he's on the side of BlackRock and Goldman Sachs. And it's like these people's progressive awareness, it stops at U.S. borders. So inside the U.S., they can recognize that Goldman Sachs doesn't have the interests of working people at heart. But over in Ukraine, they're on the exact same side as Goldman Sachs. As Goldman Sachs and BlackRock promised to turn Ukraine into what the head of BlackRock called a beacon of capitalism. (laughs) That's what Bernie Sanders is now on the side of in Ukraine. That, that's a really good point. And it actually brings up something I wanted to mention, which is that one of AOC's constituents actually managed to get a response from her about why she voted for the $40 billion in aid, which was the really important aid package that provided at least a year's worth of war. And she said, because it contained billions of dollars for uh, assisting Ukrainian refugees, in Western Europe and other places, and that she supports refugees. So that was her kind of whitewashing or refugee washing of this disgusting war. And uh, there's a Channel 4 special, Channel 4 in the UK special, on how some of those Ukrainian refugees are doing in the UK. And I wanted to play this video because it's it would be funny if it wasn't so sad. This is anyway, this is what AOC is sort of sponsoring. I think um, we hadn't necessarily taken into consideration the cultural differences. But those cultural... So just to just to brief you, and if you're just listening on audio only, there's a Channel 4 reporter in the home of a liberal woman uh, who has taken in refugees in Birmingham, UK, and she's complaining about cultural differences. And let's hear what they are. Differences weren't often talked about when Andrea signed up to the Homes for Ukraine scheme. She lives in a diverse part of Birmingham. After a week of staying there, her guest told her there were too many Muslims in the area. We were quite shocked at how difficult she found different cultures. Um, she felt there were just too many Muslims. Too many Muslims, um, too many people with different skin colours. Her guest's son was enrolled into the local school where the majority of children happened to be black and Asian. And then to just have her complain about the demographic of the school and going, well, he's, he can't be safe there. There's not enough. There's too many black people there. There's too many Asian people. They don't like them white kids essentially they both agreed to end the placement they don't realize there's lots of people that look like me here and that can be quite like wow you know i thought england was full of english people and it is because i'm english but i just look very different i'm a six foot tall black woman um so yeah i'm sure when they came in i could see people really clutching their handbags and (laughs) but by the time we'd kind of Really clutching their Azov patches. Got into it, you know, people had warmed up, there was lots more smiles, they were talking to each other. So I feel like we got it just about right. From the best area of Kiev, where I became to the worst area of the Birmingham, unfortunately. Oksana moved here from Kiev last summer. Living. So this is a Ukrainian refugee named Oksana who said she's from the best part of Kiev and now has moved to what she calls the worst part of Birmingham, and we'll hear why it's the worst. Side by side with so many different cultures made her feel afraid. I was very afraid because it was not you know, usually for me. And I also, I, uh, and some, uh, some uh, people just uh, told me about so many uh, dangerous stories. Lots of people here would feel very offended that you feel just because it's a mixed area, it's not safe. 
I saw statistics uh, on the police uh, website, police, and so I saw statistics of criminals instead of, of this. And also I read in the internet in English when I began that is, this is the area from Boja, terrorism. Oksana has now. This is an area of terrorism. So meaning uh, there are Muslims there. So yeah, uh, the word racism is never mentioned in that report, uh, but we constantly heard, including from Channel 4, that there are no uh, ultra-nationalist elements in Ukraine. Azov and their, the Social National Party are not popular, but you can see why those kind of politics have festered in Ukraine, and now they're coming to the UK and coming to Western Europe. And this woman actually voluntarily left her home and left the community that was there to support her in solidarity because there were too many blacks and Muslims there. And going back quickly to what AOC said and justifying uh, her vote for funding the proxy war and saying that, well, she supports the money for refugees. Well, if you want to support refugees, what, another option is to not support policies that create refugees. And instead of funding a proxy war that will guarantee more refugees, you could call for diplomacy with Russia immediately on all the issues that need to be addressed. The expansion of NATO, the placement of U.S. weapons surrounding Russia, the Minsk peace process, which has been sabotaged inside Ukraine, um, which is supposed to end the civil war that began after the 2014 coup. And recently we've had uh, NATO leaders like Angela Merkel admit that Minsk was not meant to make peace in Ukraine. It was meant to buy time for Ukraine to fight Russia. So rather than going along with that, you can actually say, we, let's have serious diplomacy instead of funding all these proxy war bills that give a token amount of money to, to uh, refugees. And remember what happened when progressives tried to do that for 24 hours. They put out a letter calling for diplomacy with Russia, and that got retracted uh, under pressure from the usual devoted proxy wars uh, warriors in Congress and the media. 24 hours, and that was it. So that's an alternative uh, option if you want to support refugees is to stop supporting policies that create them. Well, the whole point of that refugee money that AOC was voting for, aside from refugee washing her vote, is to provide a ventilation mechanism for the war machine, for the war state, because they know they're going to create refugees when they come in and start escalating, bringing in the high Mars, bringing in the tanks, extending the conflict, avoiding negotiation. And so- that's the role of the progressive squad is to actually create a ventilation mechanism so that the war can go on. And of course, they put it all on the lap of Western Europeans. The U.S. isn't going to accept many Ukrainian no. refugees. And in new polls, uh, Democrats are uh, showing that they are not as supportive as they were six months ago of taking in large numbers of Ukrainian refugees, 10% uh, less than the last poll. So, uh, deeply depressing. And I think we'll see more and more of this going into 2023, because as someone, we just had a question from a commenter about whether we see negotiations on the horizon. No, I don't. I think that the State Department wrote up a phony peace proposal for Zelensky to put forward so they can continue making war because the proposal is something that would never be acceptable to the other side. Oh, yeah. Well, Zelensky's uh, conditions have been that all Russian forces have to leave Ukraine first and Crimea, Crimea has to be uh, given up by Russia. And yeah. so they, they know that they have no chance of 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 having these proposals um, uh, being being met by Russia. I mean, there's like they're having their conditions met by Russia. They know that um, they're not interested in any kind of serious talks. And. Again, this is not just about even internally the, the issue in Ukraine and the status of Crimea and the Donbass. There's also the matter which Russia uh, tried to resolve with proposals in December 2021. Russia gave a long treaty, uh, uh, submitted long treaties to NATO and the U.S. with detailed proposals on addressing the placement of NATO weaponry surrounding Russia. And yeah. that could have been seriously pursued and it will need to be pursued uh, one day, whether neocons in Washington like it or not, because Russia has nuclear weapons. So unless we just want perpetual, perpetual war, these issues are going to have to be addressed. And rather than addressing them back then, we've had this insane war that is only getting worse. It's pretty, it's, it's pretty amazing because you hear this mantra of victory, victory from the 
warmongers, like the soft handed warmongers, like Michael McFall, they constantly are imposing a narrative of total victory on Ukraine when it's completely impossible. And interestingly, Bob Menendez in the Senate hearing yesterday on quote unquote Russian aggression said that to Victoria Newland directly, I think you need to do a better job of defining what victory looks like. Mm. And they're not quite able to do that at this point. They're going to yeah. say, wait till the tanks get hit the ground and we're going to see. Um, but there, there will eventually be a negotiation and it will have been one that could have happened. Maybe 10,000, 20,000, 50,000 lives lost before those lives were lost. That many, more people, that many more fathers, that many more sons and brothers were still alive. Victory for the U.S. just means bleeding Russia as much as possible, causing enough economic deprivation that the people of Russia turn against Vladimir Putin, because so far his poll numbers are still pretty good. And that's the goal. That's it. They don't care about Ukraine defending Ukraine. They don't care about Crimea. Uh, and by the way, if anyone did care about Crimea, they'd listen to U.S. government funded polls, which show that a majority of Crimeans have consistently supported joining Russia. So um, the fact that they're willing to risk, you know, uh, so many dangers and sacrifice so many people's lives just for a country in Ukraine that they don't care about uh, is just, you know, what, what can you say? Um, all the adjectives in the world can't describe it. And it's the, the, amazingly still in Congress. There's no progressive will at all for even trying to suggest diplomacy when even they have the cover of Mark Milley, the chair, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. He's been stronger on calling for diplomacy than they have. That's where we're at. Well, I have one condition for supporting the continuation of this war, and it's that we parachute Mitt Romney to the front lines. Yeah. <laughs> if we can get mittens out there, then maybe, you know, Mitt Romney, Sean Penn should fight, as someone just pointed out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, <sighs> do you want to do another segment? On the I, think we have, files. I think we have time for one more, one quick right. segment. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Let's, let's tee that up. Matt, Matt Taibbi has uh, some new files out that relate to our discussion with him last week. Um, and this relates to the whole scam of Russian bots. So, Oh, cool. There's a new video. All right. Well, um, welcome to the gray zone. If you're just joining, we're, I'm here with Aaron Mate, my colleague at the gray zone. And we've been discussing the proxy war in Ukraine, but the background noise to that war was the Russia gate hoax and the hysteria that was ginned up manufactured by intelligence related op outfits like the Alliance for Securing Democracy and its Hamilton 68 dashboard of Russian bots, the hysteria over Russian bots and trolls infiltrating U.S. media and basically hacking the brains of Americans to make them even participate in destabilizing protests. So Matt Taibbi, our friend over at Substack, independent journalist, has obtained files at Twitter HQ, which demonstrate the Twitter executives knew that the Hamilton 68 dashboard that they were being told to obey as a guide for censorship was a complete fraud, that they chose to say nothing and didn't blow this scandal up. And that, yes, the Alliance for Securing Democracy was lying to the American public to gin up Russiagate. So here's Matt Taibbi's thread. Aaron, any, any comments before we play his video? Well, just like the theme of uh, Matt's reporting on the Twitter files so far is just the intense pressure that Twitter came under from Russiagate fraudsters to validate their scam. So when Twitter looked for Russian bots, they came up empty. They found nothing. And so there was just this huge deluge of pressure from uh, people at the FBI, from the uh, from prominent Democrats like Mark Warner and Adam Schiff on Twitter to come up with something that could make Russiagate look credible. And this Hamilton uh, 68 dashboard, which supposedly tracked all these Russian bots, is another example of that. Well, here's a little video Matt made, I, I, I presume, with uh, Matt Orfalea at Racket, which is the name of his new Substack site. Now you and your team, you guys created a website. Hamilton 68. Yes, my colleagues and I, we tracked Russian accounts. That's some bullshit. 
So they're literally right now, they're Russian bots, according to your website, that are putting this out into the world. Is that right. correct? Hey, bull uh, you and your team, you guys created a website. Hey. So, yeah, it's BS. And uh, if you look at the second tweet, this is Yoel Roth, who was the sort of tw Twitter's director of moderation, wow. saying, I think, I think we need to just call this out as the BS it is. Even Yoel Roth called bullshit on this, which is hilarious because Yoel Roth is the Twitter executive who recommended that Twitter suppress reporting on the Hunter Biden laptop after some former U.S. officials said that it could be part of a Russian plot. So Yoel Roth, who's a documented dupe, was still able to see through the BS that was the Hamilton 68 scam. So that's, that's yeah, pretty I mean, damning for Clint Watts because even a dupe like Yoel Roth could see through it. Yeah, I mean, Yoel Roth... He's he's part of the regime. He believed in using Twitter as a vehicle to advance the political aspirations of the Democratic Party. That's pretty clear. And here he just he believes at least in some semblance of truth and that this was just an attempt by this, you know, hysterical Russiagate figures who were part of the board of the Alliance for Securing Democracy, like Michael McFall, like Bill Kristol. Uh, I think Michael Mor Morell was on the board, former deputy CIA director. And Max, just remind us again, so what was going on? So I remember at the time, this was a big deal. So I remember there was all these stories in the New York Times, Washington Post saying, the Alliance for Security and Democracy, this dashboard has kept track of all these Russian bots and they're littering social media. And uh, this was used to justify, you know, crackdowns and or, or censorship and moderating content. But like, wh what was the impact of this at the time? Because I remember you did a big piece on this. And the well, I, I think I was the first journalist to call out Clint Watts as a complete fraud. I did a series yeah. on him and all the other people that he was working with at the Alliance for Securing Democracy. I saw the writing on the wall and I saw that this was part of a wider attempt to influence the American public to support a war with Russia, to believe that Russia was infiltrating the social media platforms that function as their digital commons and yeah. that any story they saw that criticized the establishment could be portrayed as Russian influence, which was what they proceeded to do at Hamilton 68 with this dashboard. Right. So they said all along Hamilton 68 that they had a list of 500 Russian bots that they provided it to Twitter and told Twitter, you have to take these all down. And they were telling the public that there were these bots. And I would always say, produce the list, show us the list. Yeah. Where's the list? Prove it. And you'll see in Matt Taibbi's thread, the Twitter executives like you all Roth were saying, this list is basically a bunch of conservative accounts mixed in with like the Russian foreign ministry. There are no Russian bots here. Yeah. It's all a lie. We yeah. need to call it out. And who tells him not to call it out? It's Emily Horn, the director of communications at Twitter, who was former Obama NSC and went on to work in the Biden administration mm -hmm. and someone who would go on to work for Pete Buttigieg's campaign, who's a Twitter executive who said, well, there are long term issues here, even though we acknowledge it's false. <laughs> and what are the long-term issues? We need to help the Democrats win. And this is part of their formula is uh, Trump, Russia, Trump, Russia. And one name that appears in this list of uh, Russian bots is Joe Loria, who's the editor-in-chief of Consortium News, uh, you know, great site founded by the legendary reporter Robert Perry. And yeah. he is named, according to Clint Watts and his dashboard, as a Russian bot. I mean, this is pure McCarthyism. It is a literal blacklist for the digital era. It's disgusting. That's why I called them the, you know, did McCarthy, I, McCarthyism incorporated in one of the headlines of a piece mm. I did about them back in 2018. And Aaron, we have the list. We finally have the list. Yep. yep. Um, so we're going to be dropping the list later today, hopefully, or tonight at the gray zone. Um, you know, my schedule is pretty packed, but I'm going to do my best to get it up there. The list will see the light of day. If it doesn't see it through us, it'll see it through someone else, but you will see on this list, there are 538 names. And I don't think any of them are bots controlled by Russian intelligence. Yeah. Uh, I think RT, like, like, like RT. RT well, we, they, we yeah. know what that is. They openly yeah, Russian say intelligence. Russia today. Yeah. So. yeah. 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 The idea of the, the bot is like, it poses as a conservative with an American flag while advancing a Russian agenda. Yeah. It's insidious, but that's not what was going on here. Um, all right. Well, that brings us to four o'clock. Is there a Jimmy Dore stream now? Jimmy starting uh, right after this. So yeah, uh, people can go over and keep the stream going.
Well, I hope Jimmy, he has guests yeah. I like because we just promoted him. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, well, thanks everyone for for joining us and for all your support. And uh, we'll yeah we're, we'll be back by next Friday. And in the meantime, I'm going to have some some more interviews up on the site that I'm conducting exclusively at Rockfin. As I always mention, we're on Pacifica uh, with highlights of all of our interviews. WBAI 99.5 Sunday at 6 p.m. and KPFK LA 90.7 FM every Tuesday at 5 p.m. So you can check us out there on the Pacifica site or just go to uh, Spotify or Anchor FM and search my name, Max Blumenthal, and you'll find my podcast, which contains audio of all of these episodes. And, you know, so if you're in the gym or the supermarket or whatever, and you can't watch, you can just listen right there. Uh, Aaron, you got anything coming up? I got a lot on my plate uh, because now this Duma report just came out from the OPCW and I'll have to respond to that fraud. And there's a lot of fraud to cover. So look, out, that's going to take a bit because OPCW stories are very, are, are, are tricky. It's a lot of material to go through. So I'll do that. And then, um, there's also some new Russiagate developments happening, which I will get into when I can. So yeah, just stay tuned. All right. Well, thanks again, everybody. We really appreciate you and we'll be back next week. Peace. Peace.